All right. Well, hello again, everyone. This is Ryan Knowles, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the Aeneid lines 1 through 11 and its scansion. So before I actually get to the Aeneid itself and start diving into the lines and breaking them down, I'm just going to cover a couple of key terms that you need to know to really make sure that you're doing your scansion right. So to start off with the basic term for the type of poetry that the Aeneid is, we'll be looking at dactylic hexameter. So it's a very long, lengthy sounding word, but basically it's just a type of poetic meter that's typically used in epic poetry. So it's what the Aeneid's written in, and it was also what Homer's Iliad and Odyssey were written in. Now this isn't just a coincidence, this was deliberate on Virgil's end, because the Aeneid is Roman propaganda and Rome looked up to ancient Greece. So by having a callback to some of these what would have been well-known and beloved tales and spinning it from the Roman perspective, Virgil's sort of already drawing in his audience. And basically this hexameter here, the hexa meter, means that there are six feet in every meter. Now when I say feet, I'm not talking about a human foot, I'm talking about a poetic foot. So what a foot actually is, is a grouping of syllables based upon long and short sounds. It's not the easiest thing to process in a vacuum, but I promise I'm gonna get to examples and all that sort of thing in a minute here, so the definition will make a little bit more sense. What you need to know for now, though, is that there's two types, the spondy and the dactyl. So the spondy, represented here by dash dash, is two long sounds. So when you're reading a line, you might see something like cano, tro, so that o tro has a sort of pause to it, that's the two longer sounds. It's also always going to be the sixth foot in the meter, which makes breaking down the scansion really helpful because you know for a fact that there will always be that spondy at the end. Now the only other type of foot that you'll see used in dactylic hexameter is the dactyl, which is right in the name, which is represented here by a dash u u. So that's going to be one long and two short sounds. Uh, in the Aeneid itself, the opening line, arma we rumque, it starts off with a dactyl, arma we. So you have that long, short, short, and that right there will be your dactyl. Typically, about 95% of the time, it'll be the fifth foot in the meter leading right into that spondy. So you're going to have long, short, short, long, long. Now, since all of these terms seem like mumbo jumbo in a vacuum, I think it would probably be best to move along to the Aeneid itself so that we can begin taking a look at what they actually look like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Foolish me. Yes. No, we can't just jump into the Aeneid with only that. We need to cover one last thing, which is how do I mark up the vowels? So you're not just going to randomly assign the spondy and dactyl based off of whatever you feel like or whatever fits. No. There are ways to tell. So uh, right up on the top here, the major thing is if there's a macron on top of the word, you know that it will be a long vowel. Uh, another key thing, the U in QU does not get counted. So you're not going to have a QUE and then you're going to mark up U and E separately. You're going to have just that E marked. Now diphthongs and vowels. So a uh, diphthong will just be something like AE, two vowels next to each other or vowels like at the end of a word and then the beginning of another one, they can get elized together, which means counted as one syllable. So for some examples, you can see the diphthong here, A-E, kaikilios, it's not counted as ka e kilios it's counted as kaikilios. And then another example of this elision here is quo que et, it's made it counted as quo quet. So it's a little bit funky to read some of these elisions aloud. The diphthongs flow a, bit, a little bit more nicely because there are specific sounds for that. But when it comes to connecting, or sorry, elizing two different words, usually it just means that the first one gets dropped. So you're gonna say quo quet. You're not gonna say quo que et, just quo quet. Here that would be on et marcus. So yeah, some examples of diphthongs that can get elized are ae, which would be i, OE, which would be moi, and AU, which would be ow. Now, another key thing is you would mark it long if it's followed by two or more consonants. Uh, I don't really have any examples in mind for that, but you'll see it come up. 
and then anything not long is short. So if you have, for example, a long marked, two blank spots, and then another long, you know that that's going to be short short. All right, so with all of that in mind, it's finally time to dive into the Aeneid itself. So we have here our opening lines. Arma we rumque cano troiae qui primus aboris. Now, I already know this memorized because it is the opening line, and typically most people do, but since we're going to be breaking it down, let's start off by taking a look at it. We know that there are lots of makerons here, all over the place. So we know it's going to end in a spondy, boris. We know that sometimes a dactyl will precede the spondy, and we see here that there is that long sound. So if you've got a long sound here and two long sounds here, there's a very high likelihood that two short sounds will come in between. So it'll probably be something along the lines of primo sabores, which works. So let's keep that in mind and say that this will be a dactyl into a spondy. At the front here, it's always going to start off with a dash, even though we know here that because of that RM, it would have to be a long sound anyway. Let's see if we can't break it down a little bit more to another MQ. That's another double consonant, so we know that U is going to be long. So if we have long, blank, blank, long, we know that in between, these two are going to be short. So this is going to be a dactyl. Arma we room. We know that this is going to be long. This is long, blank, blank, long. So this is very likely going to be a dactyl as well. Arma we room que no. So now, if you remember, we have pretty much everything worked out except for this middle here. We know that this is a dactyl into a spondy. We know that this is a dactyl into a dactyl. We just need to break up this o tro. We know that these are both long. So that actually makes it a spondy right there. And that will actually solve itself because we only have two spots left. And the only foot that has two syllables will be the spondy. So that actually gives us our scansion for the first line, which will be arma we rum que cano troiae qui primo saboris. Now, I went into a little bit full explanation for that one, but I will probably be a little bit quicker with the following lines. I just wanted to really emphasize some of the rules we looked at from before. So now let's look at the next line. I have my handy paper here so that I can look at it myself. Uh, we see a macron, but of course it's always going to start with a dash anyway. Italian. So we don't really know what this is going to be. You can see that there's almost a sort of diphthong here, but traditionally IAs are a little bit funky because they don't always get LIs. They can be counted separately. And uh, just to cheat a little bit, it will for this line. So let's think about all of our longs here. I see that this will have to be long, and this will have to be long. Hmm, let me think this through. Italiam fa, that works, can be a dactyl into a spondy. Italiam fa, this is long. To, hmm, that makes sense too, because if you'll notice PR is a double consonant, so it's only natural that this would be long. Mm -hmm -hmm. Let's take a look at the end here. We know that this would be a spondy. Is there anything that will tip us off here? No. Sometimes lines aren't the clearest with what they do, and it might just be a case of trying different things and sounding them out. And that's about what I did here. Italiam fato profugus lavinia venit. That works. So. Since I can't exactly write while I'm presenting, I'll just click away, and you can see that that will be that dactyl, spondy, dactyl, spondy, dactyl, spondy. Long, short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, long. Italiam fato profugus lavinia quevenit. So if you remember earlier, I said that that IA can be a little bit weird. It's not always alive. And in this line, you can see a perfect example of that. The beginning in Italiam, E and A are taken separately. At the end here, Ya, that diphthong, is taken as one. 
So just make sure you're being careful when you're looking at that. All right, next up. We know that this is going to be a dash. Hmm. Uh-oh. It seems that this one's going to be a bit of a weird line. So this was a rule I didn't actually cover in the beginning, but it is a very important rule to keep note of. If there's a word that ends in M, and there's two vowels on either side of it, for example, U and I, you can actually elize the M and combine that to make one sound. And usually when you have an elision this long, it's going to be a longer sound. And especially because we can see that there's this double L, that's two consonants, so we know the preceding sound, which is going to combine U, M, and I, will have to be long. So we're going to know that this is going to be, it's going to read out molt E, because I said before, it lies syllables, the preceding one, the um, will not count. And there's also an elision on the opposite side here between these two E's. So you're not going to read ille et, you're going to read il et. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we see CT, so we know that this is going to be long. This is also going to be long. And because of that dactyl interspondy rule, we know alto, the three syllables preceding it, tatus et. We know that the, this is long, and there's two in between. Let's just say that this will be a dactyl. Tatus et alto. That works. So, in the end, using all of those rules and filling in the blanks, we end up with <coughs> li toro molt ilet teris jactatus et alto. On to the next one. So, when we take a look at this one here, this one doesn't exactly have very many things to keep track of. There's very few makerons of any, save for eunonius. There's almost, no, it doesn't, I don't think there's a single elision in this line. So I actually prefer lines without elisions as much as a giveaway as they are because you don't really have to keep your eyes open for them. There's no double consonants here either. So really this one's just a case of sounding it out and feeling it out. And that sounds a little bit crazy to say, but there's only so many ways you can do the chant and by ascribing them to different places, you can sort of get a feel for that. We know that this is gonna be a spondy at the end, so it's gonna read iram. We see that there's a long and two in between. We know that's going to be a dactyl. And we know that this here is long, and the only f other foot that can end in long is a spondy. So we know the last three right here. Am, you, no, ni, so, iram. And then from the start, I usually like to try out a dactyl at the beginning. As you can see, it's used three times already. So, vi, superum, sai, y, memorem, you, just by sort of sounding that out from what I know and what seems to be commonplace, we end up with. Oops, there we go. We superum sai y memorem you nonisobiram. Fairly simple. All right, next one. Again, it's going to start with a dash, but in case we didn't know that, we can see those double consonants. Let's see here, we see more double consonants, so we know that E is going to be long, we know O is long, we see more double consonants, so we know A is long, long, hmm, orbem has to be long because it's a spondy, hmm, 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 again, very high likelihood, condaret is three syllables, so it's very likely that it'll be a dactyl, that long, short, short. And if we pay attention to that long wave of longs in between, we end up with something. Oh, sorry, before I actually click away, I just want to point out there is an elision in this line here between quoque et. That's just going to be taken as quoquet. So keeping all of that in mind, our scansion ends up looking something like this. Molta quoquet. Bello passus dum condoret ortem. So yeah, there's a whole lot of spondies in this one, but that can happen sometimes just between the elision here, the double consonant here, the macron, double consonant, macron, dactyl. This has to be a short because it's the only one that will fill that one syllable gap. Just very many things like that. A lot of this is using what you do know using process of elimination and testing. That's that's mainly the three core things at the heart of scansion. 
Now this one will be a little bit, a little bit, I almost said a lot of it, a little bit more complex than the last one, but it's nothing different from what we've been doing. We see that NF dash, we see RR, this is going to be dash, even though usually we start with a dactyl, this is going to start with a spondy. We see TQ, we know that that is going to be dash. Hmm. EO. I'm going to take those separately in this one. I think I will also be taking Latio separately here. Now this is sort of, again, me feeling it out, but I don't see either of those being taken as diphthongs in this case, especially because of the fact that you see that Macron on the O's, both of them, it instead of, you know, both syllables. So it makes me feel like the I and the O are taken separately, and in this one the E and the O are taken separately. We know that the U is going to be taken as a long because of that ND. And we know that at the end here, I, U will be a spondy. So with all of that in mind, it reads like so. Inferet que deos latio genus unde latini. So this is funny. Last time we had lots of spondies, but this time you can see that we have four dactyls. So sometimes it just works out like that, where there's lots and lots in a row. It's just important to know that there's usually the starting and ending of a meter is where you see those patterns, even though again we see here that rule violated. And the only reason I'm even talking about patterns at all is because when all else fails, it can kind of help to just try and sound it out based off of what you see other lines doing, and then sometimes that works out. All right. Now this next line here, there is actually a complexity that I want to point out. I'm sorry, Latin does this sometimes, but there is a rule that we have to break. Even though there's a TR here, which makes me want to put that A as long, it will actually not work out like that. So you'll see that this has to be a dash, this has to be a dash, we know that's a spondy. This is a dash, okay? And we know this has to be a dash because of that maker on. So we have a dash, two things in between, and then another dash. The only thing that'll fit here is a dactyl. So even though we have that patres, we have to take the A as a short. It's painful, it's terrible, awful, I know, but Latin does that sometimes. Thankfully, with our TQ, it does obey the rules, and we'll be taking that A as long. We'll be elizing the E and the A, and taking this as long, we'll be taking this diphthong as long, we're taking this diphthong, long, and we see here there's going to be spondy, so if you have long, blank, blank, spondy, it's probably going to be long, short, short, spondy. And that will make our scansion come out looking like... Oh, not bad. Oh, dear. Exposed to the next one. Albani que patres at qual ni aroma. Yes, that's a little bit weird, but the elisions, you don't pronounce that quay, you just scoot along with the sound. Because remember, they would be chanting this to memorize it, so they'd sort of understand what would go in that blank. As English readers, it's a little bit weirder to hear, but yeah. Alright, on to the next one. We see this dash, we see that this is a dash, there's a likelihood that this dash, blank blank dash, is going to mean this is a dactyl. Causas, I'm tempted to take the diphthong AU as a long, especially with this long here, because that would mean it goes dactyl, long, long, so that dactyl spondy. Sas, hmm. We know this is long, we see long, blank, blank, long, so it's going to be a dactyl probably. Long, long, this is spondy. Lyso, that's going to be a spondy. So when we have numine, ah, three syllables, how perfect, it works out. It's a dactyl. And that will give us mu sa mihi sas memora quo numine liso. That one's considering uh, all the rule breaking and elations in this line. This one's a nice simple break. Okay, we're almost there. Three lines left. It's 11 lines, but you can see that scansion is very complex and a long and thorough process. We're going to see here that there's a D and a V, double consonant. So even if we didn't know that the qui was a starting long sound, we would be able to determine that. Uh, we know that this is long, 
we have long blank blank long so dactyl so this is going to go long short short long 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 so this is going to go dactyl and then lens rare it's going to be spondy hmm let's see casa spinar is it spondy Wolwere. I see three syllables. I want that to be a dactyl, and I think thankfully it will be. So that'll work out. Now we have three at the beginning. We have two at the end. That leaves two in the middle. That will have to be between ina deum tot. That's five syllables total. So we know it's going to be a combination of dactyl and spondy. And this is maybe just me and the way my brain works, but. Uh, just, I usually like to set up into the dactyl with a longer one. You can take some experimentation to figure this one out, but um, because of the fact that this starts long, this is probably going to go long, short, short, long, long. And it does. Quid we do lens regina deum tot volvare casus. Yeah, overall, this one a little bit more experimental, but compared to line two up here, this is another simple one. All right, it's gonna be second to last line here. It starts off with a spondy instead of a dactyl because we see that in C. Again, GN, if this makeup wasn't here, we'd be able to tell that this is longer uh, because this M, there's a consonant after it, we're not aligning it. It's gonna be, this has to be a long M, PA, oh, that IE, that IA. Usually anything with I before it, you can take separately from what I've seen. So I believe that this long blank blank into a long means that this will be a dactyl. M P E T A. Hmm. Let's see. What else can we determine from this? Ores. We know that this has to be a spondy at the end. Can we fit a dactyl into it? Doesn't seem like there's anything that says we can't especially with this long here to I. So we have that long, blank, blank, long. I think this will be a dactyl. So we know here this is a spondy. This is going to be a dactyl, leading it to ta. And then the only thing we need to work out at this point would be te virum tot a, which is going to be, I believe, six syllables. Ta te virum tot a. Now, since we only have two feet left and there's six syllables, that works itself out. You know that there's not going to be any spondy, because if there was anything less than six, which is two threes, then it wouldn't be six. That's common sense. So that actually solves itself. Process of elimination saves the day yet again, and that'll give us the scansion of in signem pieta te virum tota dire laboris. Awesome. Now on to the final line of the entire scansion, at least the first 11 lines of the Aeneid. <clears throat> Let's see, we've got consonants here, double consonants, so that's going to do that. Oh, and NT, that tells us this is going to be long. So if we have long, hmm, no, we can't quite figure this one out yet, as much as I would love to. Do you know that this is going to be long? We see that diphthong here. It's very likely that this will be long as well. So if we focus on estibus, again, since we know this is spondy, I can usually just blur that out of my mind and not worry about it. If we take care of that, we know that this is probably going to be long and this is probably going to be long. So there's a chance that this might get grouped together as a spondy. If it does, that means estibus, three syllables right before that last spondy. That could very well be a dactyl. So if we do that, that'll give us our second half of the entire scansion. It would be, hmm, is kai lestibus ira, which does sound kind of right. So if we go back to the beginning here, we know that there's got to be at least two dactyls here, because look how many syllables are left. Impulere tantaine ani. That's at least, I believe, <laughs> eight syllables. So we know that that is going to have to be the breakdown. The only way you can get eight if you had two spondies, that would be four, plus three would be seven. So because it's eight, we know that there's going to be two dactyls, one spondy. Now, keep in mind, the only long sound we found in this area came from this NT here. So either this tan tai is going to be a spondy, or an eat tan is going to be the spondy. 
Now if we try it out, just from working it out, and again what we generally know with it starting with dactyl, if we try it out we go impuleritantaine. Oh, of course, how could I be so ridiculous? There's an elision to focus on right here. Tanta. It's not gonna be tantaine, it's gonna be tantainanimos. So this is actually painful. <laughs> I say painful because it pains me that whoever created Latin didn't stick consistently to the rules. So typically with elisions, we see that gets counted as a longer one. I believe this is the only exception to that. I have not paid full close attention, so if I'm wrong, feel free to smite me. But I think this is the only exception where this works out to be short. Anyway. So just from showing you my thought process here, I again can't write anything down, so I'm sorry if I'm getting a little bit scatterbrained here. Let's just jump to the scansion. You'll see that, aha, it was eat tan that ended up being the spawning. So it'll be impuleritantai nanimis kai lestibus irai. All right, so finally done. <laughs> I say that without any sense of conclusion because this is not the end of the Aeneid. This is the first 11 lines. Yeah. You can see that there's a lot of thought and thorough work that goes into breaking down the scansion of the Aeneid in just this opening section. And I think that that's important to keep in mind when reading the Aeneid. Not because, oh, you're a reader, you need to constantly be breaking it down. Not because we need to remember that the ancient Romans did this to memorize it, although both are important things. I think, personally, the most important thing to remember is the writer, Virgil. He had to actually deliberately, every time he wrote a line, make sure he was fitting into this syllable pattern of dactylic hexameter, and the fact that no matter what line you look at, it works out like that. I don't know. I think it kind of just blows my mind, the level of effort it must have taken to write the Aeneid while also having lines make sense. But I think that's kind of also why you see poetry break the rules so frequently, because writers needed tactics that would allow them to fit into the meter. For example, things like enjambment, where you take a word and scoot it to the next line, or things such as ellipsis, where a word's just not even included. You see that happen because they need to fit the meter. So as readers from English, we kind of lose that sense of appreciation, so personally, I don't even care about the scansion itself. I think it's just cool to look at the breakdown and think about all the work that put into this. So, yeah, that's that's it for the uh, scansion of lines 1 through 11. Hopefully you enjoyed my thorough breakdown. I tried my best to explain my thought process that went into everything here. And uh, thank you for watching.